you know, and that, that's uh, what makes them good is consistency. You know, you, you got to have the, the bloodline and the good traits and, and all that. But if you don't take them out there and let them do their, their ability, um, they're never going to be good. You know, I don't care what kind of bloodline you got. If you're not going to use them, they're not going to be good. Hi, my name is uh, Michael Ewing. Um, I'm a fourth generation houndsman in my family. I've been breeding and training hounds my whole life. Um, I've hunted all over California, Oregon, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico. I've had my dogs in you know quite a few different states hunting. Um, I've also do done dog trials with them. Um, you know, all, anything involved with hounds, I'm all about them. You know, bunch of houndsman clubs throughout the state, I'm board members. I'm vice president for a couple of them. Uh, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm just pretty much my whole life's been revolved around hounds and training dogs. Wouldn't know what to do without dogs around. <laughs> That's great. I, I would have to imagine that the, the sports evolved a lot over time too. You, you go back four generations and the way they hunted with these hounds might be a little bit different than, than some of the technology you, you have today. I mean, how did, how did you get into it from your father or grandfather and has it evolved much since then? Oh yeah, it's involved a lot since then. Um, so I basically, like I said, just born into it, been around them my whole life. Uh, when I was old enough to walk, I, you know, started going with my dad and stuff and and hunting. But back then we had we had no tracking collars, no nothing. All it was was just the uh, turn the dog loose and you got to listen to them with their sound and hope for the best, you know. And uh, then they got uh, telemetry collars where it just puts up a signal and you can go around and beep you know, and kind of get a direction that your dog's in, but, you know, that wasn't really that great either. You know, you can kind of know where they're at, but you don't know how close they are. And you spend hours trying to figure out how to get to them and a lot of gas and a lot of walking, you know, and then uh, now they come out with GPS collars. So it'll, you can track your dog, shows a map on there, shows you what road they're close by. Uh, the GPS collars are, are great. You know, they're really good for uh, hound recovery, safety of the dog, you know, make sure they're not going on private property or getting by a highway or anything like that. Um, and then you can, you know, they'll, they'll track for miles and miles and you can share it with your friends, you know, so if you're hunting buddy, you can give them your collar information so they can help track your dogs and you can track their handheld so you know where everybody's at, you know where all your dogs at. It's, it's way safer for the dogs. Yeah, now that you mentioned the collars, I remember a couple times I was hiking with my wife. I think we were, yeah, we were married at the time. And we were going through the woods and we just came across a couple dogs that were, I think one was limping, but they had that long, long antenna on it. And they had their collar with the number on it. And we didn't know if they were injured or whatever, but we ended up calling the number. And they said, yeah, they're fine. They'll find their way home. Don't worry about them. I, I would have to assume that that was, that was them kind of training them or letting them run wild to try to find their way back home. Is, is that accurate or am I way off base there? So back, back in the day, they used to have, they call them homers, good homers. So you train them to come back to where you turn them loose at just because they're so hard to track, you know, back then. Um, it's kind of gotten away from that nowadays with the GPS callers because you can pretty much get close as you can to them, you know, and call them to you. And, you know, it, it's a, uh, you hardly ever leave one out in the woods anymore with these GPS collars, unless you get a collar malfunction or something like that. But a lot of guys will run two collars on their dogs just so in case one goes down, then they still can track another dog you know, or track with another collar. So you said that homers, so that's like a, a type of dog that you would train, right? That's just a, a trait in a dog that you train them. You know, you'll train them to Got come it. back to where you turn loose, um, you know, just so you don't have to wonder where they are, you know, if they go out there and they lose the track or, or something, they'll come right back to where you turn them loose. You know, they used to breed okay. for that. They used to try to get dog, teach dogs to do that. Guys would take their jackets and lay them on the ground where they turn the dog loose. That way, if it came back, it would stay there and learn to stay there until the owner gets back to pick them up. You know, it worked pretty well back then, you know, because there's no technology. You just turn them loose and listen for their bark and follow them around that way. That makes sense. And I, I think this is a pretty good transition to get into the types of, because I, I know there's all these things that you, all these traits you want to train into these dogs to make them good at whatever you're trying to hunt. Um, and I, I believe that there's like a lineage element to this. I mean, in horse racing, you want to 
breed a horse that is from like a winning mother or whatever. And I, I think there's an element to that in the dog. So maybe you can go into the, the style of hunting that the, each of these dogs have some of the traits and then maybe the breeds that, that you're normally working with in, in houndsmen. Okay, yeah, so most of my dogs are what they call a running dog, which is a foxhound, you know, like American foxhound or a trig foxhound. Um, so mine are, are running dog, foxhound, crossed with coonhounds, which is a, the breed I use, a treeing walker coonhound. So the reason I use those is because a running dog has a lot of stamina. They're bred for, to run a track very well. You know, they hardly make any loses. You know, they'll run a track like they're tied to it pretty much. Um, not all of them, but that's what they're supposed to do. And the tree dog is when the animal goes up a tree. So the gray fox climbs a tree, which the gray fox is the only fox that can climb a tree. Uh, the rest of the fox can't. So the dog will figure out what tree it goes up, locate, and then start barking up the tree, which is called treed. Um, so with the foxhound type dogs, they're hard to get to do that because they're not bred to do that. That's not natural for them. So that's why I crossed the foxhound with the coonhound and got the dogs I got. But I've been breeding the same line of dogs for 29 years now. And I I've, I've have dogs all over. Uh, I got dogs uh, Tennessee, Utah. I um, got some that are in Finland. Uh, I mean, all I've shipped dogs all over. You know, a lot of guys hunt, hunt the dogs that I've bred and use them for you know bear hunting fox hunting mountain lion hunting a lot of dog trials uh, lots of different things uh, so that's one type type that i use and prefer um, but then there's another type of dog which is a really cold nose cold trail you know real methodical on a track and that's more like your blue tick black and tan uh, red tick those kind of breeds they're known to just be real methodical and they, they, they'll they'll you know, run a track that like a lion track, some guys claim that they can smell one that's two days old. And, you know, they'll track it for all day long, you know, and then go back the next day, put it where they left off and track it again for you know, another day. And, you know, my dogs aren't bred to do that. But, you know, it's a totally different breed, but they're not known to be super fast and have a lot of stamina, those blue tick, black and tan type cold nose breeds. And then they have the, the training walker, which is, kind of a popular breed and they do a lot of competition coon hunting and stuff like that back east with them. Uh, they do it with all the dogs, you know, blood, uh, not blood hunt, black and tans, blue ticks, plots. Uh, they do a bunch of competition hunts back there. But that's a totally another different style than what I hunt. Um, those dogs are bred to be real independent and not really hunting in a pack. They're bred to be out there by themselves, go and the, there's a judge and the judge will give the dog points when the dog starts the track it gets x amount of points when it trees the animal it gets x amount of points so first dog to do it second dog gets a little less points and then you know then they end up going on to the next hunt and then they have a world hunt they got truck hunts where they give away trucks they got it's you know quite a big deal back there um but yeah there's a uh, lots of different styles lots of different breeds of dogs it just depends on what everybody likes you know everybody's different Everybody likes a different style and also depends on what game you're running, you know. You know, I, I've been coon hunting once. There's bear, there's mountain lions, as you said, and then fox. Is that is that all the, the types of animals that people run? No, people run uh, deer with hounds. Um, they run coyotes. Uh, you know, raccoons. I mean, just about anything, really. It depends on what people like to hunt. But a, a hound, you know, can basically, is, you know, like the the term hound means, you know, they hound something, you know, they just keep after it and keep pursuing it until they catch up to it and the animal will climb a tree. Or if it is a treatable animal or a deer, you know, they'll just circle them around and run them out, you know, where the hunter is at. They can look at it and see what kind of, you know, how big it is or if it's a buck or a doe or whatnot, but I've never actually been deer hunting with hounds, so I don't really know a whole lot about deer hunting, but back east is pretty big. There's a lot of guys that, that do it. You know, and red fox, they hunt a lot of red fox back east with them. Um, yeah, there's, like I said, coyote guys that run coyotes with them. Uh, just about anything you think of, you know, a lot of guys will, will chase them. Like in Australia, they run, the, I think it's called sandbar deer. They chase those over there with hounds. Uh, yeah, they're they're pretty uh pretty versatile. Wild hogs, 
I don't know a lot of guys that hunt wild hogs with them. I know people do pheasant and rabbits, but I think that that's uh, you know that's a totally different style breed too. But is that yeah, still considered are, hound hunting? No, then those are, hounds, those are bird dogs, upland dogs. You know, like okay. English pointer, German short hairs, that type of stuff. You know, then the duck dogs okay. and labs and Chesapeake's and. So I kind of want to go back to the deer thing because that's that's nuts to me. I I go rifle hunting every year, and you know my family's really big into deer hunting. It, how does that work? Because in in bear, coon, fox, uh, mountain lion, you're you're trying to eat them treed and pretty much sitting there so that you can come up to them and shoot them or not. Uh, with a deer, how how does that work? Are they kind of just trying to guide it to you, or is it is it different than that? So basically what they do is they'll send the dogs into the thick brush or whatever, and the dog will run the deer out of there. And so then you could get out in the open and see what it is and if you want to harvest it or whatever. That's from what I gather. Like I said, I've never deer hunted with hounds, so I don't really know a whole lot about it and how it works. But what I gather, basically the dog just tracks the deer down and, and gets the deer moving. So the hunter has a better chance, you know, to get it out of the thick brush and stuff like that. And they have like deer clubs, you know, back there where they have these uh, areas where these houndsmen can go and, and run the deer and stuff like that back there. But that's basically that's all I've, I've, never heard about. I've never heard of that. And that's, that's something I'll have to look into. Not, not that I'll be able to go. Yeah. It's legal in California to run deer with dogs. You're allowed one dog per deer tag in California. There's not very many people that do it here, but it, it is one thing that is legal to do here. Wow. Wow. That's really cool. Uh, yeah. And, and this kind of reminds me of a little story that I, I forgot about this one, but I went camping up in the upper peninsula in Michigan one time and it was, it was during COVID. So everybody decided they liked camping and all the campgrounds are full. We ended up just kind of going on state line land and finding this area to camp in. And, uh, one night we were driving back to our campsite from town and saw a bear probably, I don't know, a hundred meters from our our campsite and that kind of spooked us a little bit because we're just we're in tents and you know i had a dog and i think we had our kid up there at the time um in the next morning we woke up to just total chaos and it was it was people running bear up there in the up which is something i had never experienced before i didn't know that was a thing until then and I, it's i believe you have a ton of you know bear running experience uh can you maybe tell us a little bit about what you have hunted and what differs between those animals yeah so i'll start with bear since you mentioned that but yeah I've, I've, uh, back in 2012 the state of california outlawed bear hunting with hounds so you can't do that anymore here but up until then i, I hunted bears here you know regularly and uh so basically a bear is you know, we put the dogs on the top of the truck on the back of the dog box you'll drive around when they smell a bear they'll bark um, that's called a rig dog and rig dogs are actually pretty hard to train. You know, it's hard to get a dog that will smell a bear off the truck or any animal. But once you finally get one trained to do that, you drive around, turn the dog loose, and then the race is on. That bear will run down in the deepest, darkest canyon you can think of. They always go to the worst plot place, it seems like. And so the dogs will track it down. And then, you know, whether it's a, if it's a cold track, you know, they got to methodically move along until they get it hotter, and then they'll get it jumped and running and then tree the bear and then you walk in there and then uh, hunting with hounds is the only form of catch and release hunting so you get in there look at it it's a sow with cubs you just grab your dogs and let it leave it in the tree let it go um or if it's you know you can tell it's nursing or if it's a female you know and it's not a big mature boar you know you don't have to harvest it uh, most hound hunters don't harvest a lot of animals it's a uh, you know a lot of it's about the sound of the hound not the thrill to kill a lot of guys uh are all about just training the dogs and watching the dogs do what they're bred to do and you know work the animal work the track um so their houndsmen are pretty conservationists you know they really selective on what they harvest uh most houndsmen will not kill any females of, of any type of animal you know only older mature males um but yeah back to the how the bears run you know they're more of a straight line down to the biggest canyon or up to the top of the biggest mountain you know it seems like they're always just going far away from the road as they can you know so then you got to walk in there no matter how far the dogs went you know miles 
you know, I've, I've had some long, hard walks crawling through brush and rocks and creeks and, you know, you name it. Um, but yeah, bears is, you know, pretty tough animal to treat the dog consistently. Um, and then the gray fox is a totally different aspect. They're, I think they're a harder animal for a dog to uh, track, to pursue, because they're so smart and they'll do figure eights and loops and they'll cut back on the track and they'll, you know, they out try to outfox the dog. So uh, sometimes they'll run for an hour, sometimes they'll run for five, six, seven, eight hours, you know, before they ever climb a tree. So it takes the dog a lot of stamina and a lot of heart, you know, to stick with that track that long before that fox, you know, fox has got, you know, the advantage big time on a dog, you know, they're a lot faster, a lot smaller, get to the brush a lot better. So you got to have a pretty good uh, track dog to, to treat those consistently. And if you get too many dogs out there, the unexperienced dogs, and you get a dog that's barking out of place or barking behind and the dogs lose that track, they'll turn and go back to that dog. They think it found the track. And then by that time, the fox is so far gone, you'll never catch it. With a bear, it's a little bit different because they leave a lot more scent, a lot bigger animal. Um, they don't do all these tricky curves and turns and all that. So, you know, a dog could, you can put the dog back on the bear and they might be able to trail it up and get it back jumped and run it again. But a fox pretty much once, you know, it, it outfoxes them, it's gone. You're never going to see it again. And then raccoon hunting with hounds, like you said, you've done that before. It's a, you know, they're a, a slow moving animal that leaves a lot of scent. So a dog will be trailing around, trying to figure out which way it went. They might go over to the left, might go to the right, you know, wherever that coon was feeding around, you know, all night. And then finally they'll get it lined out, run it and, you know, get it up a tree. And then they hide very well in the tree. So you get there to the tree and you might not even find the raccoon because it's so thick and it's hiding in the thickest spot of the tree, you know. But yeah, it's uh, now that you now that you mentioned that, I remember they did run one up, and my dad was just like, "It's right there. He's pointing. He's pointing." And it took me an embarrassing long time to kind of point that thing out because you're in pitch black, right? You're using flashlights to find this yeah. little little furry animal. Um, so that makes sense. And yeah, then you've done mountain spot. lions too, so yeah, mountain lions are um, they're different, totally different too. They uh, so basically, when you're mountain lion hunting, you'll drive around a lot of times in the snow. You'll try to find a track in the snow, and when you find a track, you'll judge how big it is, you know, and put the dogs on it, and then they got to trail it up. And then once they get it jumped, it, it, not, mountain lions normally don't run very far because they don't have that. They're sprinters. They don't have a great lung capacity. So once you get the lion jumped and running, it uh, normally don't run very far. It might go, you know, five, six, seven, eight hundred yards at the most, and then tree. But then it'll get up there. Bears do this too. They'll get up there and rest up, and then they see the, the us walking, the human, and then they'll jump out and run again. So you're already five miles down the canyon, and then it'll run another, you know, bear, and it'll run another five miles down the canyon, and you got to go another, you know, and there even more. But yeah, lions they they normally don't run as far as the bears, but they're kind of the same way. They they uh, see humans, they kind of get a little spooky sometimes and jump out. But most of the time they'll stay in there pretty good and you can get there and look at it and see if it's a male or female if it's a mature tom and uh, harvest it or choose to let it go tree and free but um the male mountain lions actually they'll uh they'll kill the younger cubs and stuff um and they're real territorial so if if there's a female with cubs in the area the, the male big tom will go in there and kill the cubs so the female will come back and heat again so she can breed so it's actually really good to harvest some of the bigger males, older males. It's, it helps the population grow and it allows, you know, that that, that line probably has a hundred mile radius area and then it'll allow a couple of younger toms to come in there and take over and then they'll have, you know, a 50 mile radius or whatever. So it's, it's really good for the population, you know, bobcats and bears or uh, lions both, you know, to kill the toms just to, because they'll pretty much wipe themselves out if you don't. Hmm. I know you, there's a couple of things I want to pull on from, from what you just mentioned, but bear they're if they're big enough, that's an animal that you have to, you have to like skin and quarter and everything up right then and there to, especially if you're 10 miles in, right? You're not dragging that oh, yeah. thing back to your, your truck. Do, do the dogs, I mean, can they help with that? If you get this thing all cut up, can you drape meat over them to get them back to the site? Or is it just you and your buddies stuck with that thing? No, just me and my buddies, you know, we'll have uh, pack okay. frames and we'll put the hiding head in one and then the quarters, back straps, tenderloins, you know, rib meat, whatever we can 
salvage out of there, you know, and, and uh, try to pack everything out. And yeah, that that's when the hard work begins when you have to pack one of them, you know, four or 500 pound bears out of a canyon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was why I was so nervous when we went elk hunting to even get one because of that very reason. Because we kind of went in pairs and if no service, you know, maybe we climb to the mountain and try to get service to get the rest of the gang there so we can get that thing out of there. Um, but I mean, luckily, unluckily, we did not get anything and didn't have to experience that. Um, yeah, that, that was just something that came to mind. Uh, you mentioned a few things, like you said, a lot of the times you let these, these animals go, uh, you mentioned like, it's, what was the phrase? It's not the, it's the sound of the hound, not the thrill of the kill. Yes. So <laughs> can you maybe explain all the different, uh, types of barks and what they can mean? when you're when you're out there hunting an animal okay so the the initial bark is when the dog is starting at the track so it's, we call it a strike so it's like the first bark depending on if it's a hot or a cold track you know a lot of times if it's a cold track it would just be like one bark kind of a longer bark normally depending on what type of mouth the dog has because there's a couple different types there's a ball mouth dog which is normally like your blue tick black and tan those kind of breeds some train walkers and then there's a chop mouth, which is what most of my dogs are, which they sound like a house dog, just one bark, you know. Um, but, yeah, when they first start to track, you, that's when they're striking it. And then you determine if it's a cold track or a hot track by how often they're barking. So if it's a cold track, they're just kind of pecking along and barking once in a while, just kind of moving the track slowly. Um, when it's a hotter track, they're barking, you know, more regularly and they're moving along through the country a lot better. And then when it's jumped and running, they're just barking every breath, you know, screaming. And then there's a locate bark. So when the animal goes up a tree, the dog will let out a locate bark. Normally it's kind of like a longer uh, howl. And then the dog will stop for a second, maybe let out another locate bark or two, and then they'll sit down and start treeing. And when they're treeing, it's normally a chop every breath, you know, one after another. Um, but that kind of varies too. It depends on the dog and what type of, you know, how good of a tree dog it is. But then the dog will just sit there and bark up that tree until you hike however many miles it is in there to him. And, you know, they, they pretty much will wait there until you get there. And then you decide what, you know, what kind of animal you got. And, you know, I can normally tell what they're running by the track, the style of the track, the, you know, the, the, how it's traveling, you know, uh, if it's going down like a deep, big canyon, a straight line, you know, normally it's a bear or something, or if it's going, making loops, figure eights, gray fox, you know, you can only tell what they're running by that part. But then you could just, you know, once you get to the tree, you decide if it's, something you want to harvest or something you're gonna let go. Um, but most of the time I'm just training. I hardly ever harvest anything. Um, you know, a lot of times in California, you can, there's a training area and a training season. So you can go out there as long as you have no weapon, uh, you can go out there and just train your dogs and they treat something, you just call them off. And uh, I don't even have to leash my dogs up or nothing to call them off. I just say, okay, come on, let's go. And they'll just follow me in a single file line pretty much right back to the truck. Yeah, uh, yeah, they listen really well. They're, they're, they listen better than most people's house dogs. <laughs> uh, you said that I, I thought this was kind of surprising. Like sometimes you don't even know what they're chasing after. I would have assumed that if you're out hunting bear, they know you're hunting bear, and and vice versa. Maybe it's you. You just don't care what they chase, or um... no, they 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 pretty much know. It all depends on the style of hunting you're, you're okay. doing like if you're bear hunting you're gonna have them on top of the truck rigging around they know they're looking for a bear when you're fox hunting you got them what i call roading you just put them in front of the truck and they'll road in front of the truck until they you know smell the fox and then they'll get the track going or i mean i do rig them for fox too but the you know you can't run bears here in california so you know the areas i hunt there's hardly any bears in there and it's weird it's almost like the dogs know you know they they don't when i'm hunting when i got them on the road hunting this area they don't mess with the bears at all um, but if I was in an area that had a lot of bears, maybe it'd be different. But I try to stay out of, stay away from them when I'm here. Um, normally the fox are down lower; they like the thick brush. You know, the bears are kind of more in the higher country, or they go down really low in the oaks certain times of the year. But where I fox hunt at, there's very few bears in there. So they, they, yeah. but they do kind of know. And then I got some dogs, like my younger dogs, are the ones I take out of state to Utah, Nevada. And I run those on the bears and the cats. And then my older dogs, I don't take them. So I'll let them dogs start the track. And that way I know for sure it's a fox. And then uh, and then I'll put the younger dogs in behind them. And then that way I'm you know safe and know I'm not running a 
something I'm not supposed to. That makes sense. So we, we've talked a lot about some of the different, I don't know, traits that go into these dogs and, and I guess the reasons you're picking out these different breeds to kind of fit your hunting style. Can you maybe go into how crazy it is to train up a dog this well? Cause I, I know that these dogs are likely the you know most well-behaved dogs in the world and they'll just listen to anything that you want. Um, the wind is that star and, you know, what, what, I guess, what are some of the training techniques that you have? So basically it starts from day one, the day they're born. So the day they're born, I'll go in there and, and touch them all. You know, I flip them over on their backs, touch their feet, touch their ears, their head. And I do that every day just so they're used to being handled, used to my scent being around me. I mean, when they're first born, their ears and their eyes and everything aren't open yet, but at least they're used to being touched and, and messed with. And then when they start to get a little bit older, um, when they start eating on their own, and their eyes are open and all that stuff i'll go in there and i'll pet them and put my hand in their food bowl to make sure they're not going to be aggressive to people and they all eat together so they don't you know have any food aggression fighting with each other anything like that and still handling them touching them petting them rolling them over touching their feet you know just making them where you can do anything you know that way down the road you don't have a to fight with them if you need to doctor one's foot or put some you know ointment on their feet or or give them a shot or anything like that, you know, that way they're used to being handled and used to doing all that. Um, that's not really a trait. That's more of like a training thing that you, you do with them. But a lot of them, like a, a good track dog, which meaning a dog that can follow a track very well, make the turns, you know, a lot of animals will turn and the dog will overrun the track and then have to come back and find it. But a good track dog, to me, they're born. You can't train that into them. Um, they either have it or they don't. You know, so you, you want to, when you're breeding dogs, you want to try to breed two dogs together that are really good track dogs and hope the pups come out and have been really good track dogs. But there, there's so much to it. You know, a dog's got to be a good strike dog, you know, starting the track on or off the track. It's got to be a good track dog, got to be a good locator, got to be a good tree dog, you know, got to handle good, good homer. I mean, there's so much you got to put into these dogs. And uh, I, I work with my dogs every day and I take them out and, and run fox with them, you know, four or five, six nights a week. Um, so I'll go out in the evenings and hunt for, you know, till 10, 11 o'clock and then come home and get a few hours of sleep and go to work the next day. And especially in the wintertime when it, you know, gets dark earlier, um, just about every night I'm out there with them, you know, and that, that's uh, what makes them good is consistency. You know, you, you gotta have the, the bloodline and the good traits and, and all that. But if you don't take them out there and let them do their, their ability, um, they're never going to be good. You know, I don't care what kind of bloodline you got. If you're not going to use them, they're not going to be good. And it's just, you know, it's like anything practice makes perfect. You know, if you keep, keep them on, on Fox and then they'll, they'll master the game at it. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of work, a lot of time. It's not like, you know, they're, they're not like a deer hunting where you can just put your rifle in the gun safe and you know be done for the season. It's every day. 24 hours a day you gotta care for those dogs and you gotta feed them the best dog food um i've been feeding uh green and pro plan which is 88 dollars a bag <laughs> and so yeah it's expensive but if you don't feed that good quality food you know your dog's not going to perform and these dogs you can't make a dog hunt a dog is that's in their blood that's bred for them to do that it's natural um so you know, I've heard a lot of people, oh, it's, you know, how do you make these dogs hunt? You, you can't make them hunt. If they don't have it in them, they don't want to do it. They're not going to do it. You just got to, you know, like I said, put them on a bunch of game, a bunch of tracks to where they learn how to do it, you know, better and better. But their natural ability to, to track something, even people's house pets, you know, bass and hounds, beagles, all that, they, they still want to track stuff and smell stuff. And you know, a lot of people have problems with those type of dogs as pets because they get a whip of something and they're gone, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of, uh, care, you know, you got to clean kennels and fresh water every day. And they like said exercise and food and supplements and the whole nine yards. I remember doing that with, with my dog, just, you know, getting them all the touches and making sure they're exposed to goofy things like bikes and cars and skateboards and, and all that stuff. And it, it seems like, at least from the little description you gave me on that, some of the training's more more or less the same. But yeah. 
it, I guess it, it, it's wild to me how much is ingrained in them and how important that, that lineage is to, you know, make sure you from day one have like a successful hunter. Um, yeah, yeah. Would you say a lot of the training is is pretty typical or pretty standard to like a house dog, getting them to listen, getting them to heal, getting them to you know walk us walk beside you and without a leash and all that? Yeah, I mean, I do make them they walk with me without a leash. I can you know take them anywhere, call their name, and then you know a lot of people with their dogs they'll you know call them you know here, come here, here. You know, I don't do that. I call my dog's name, so all my dogs can be running around together, and I'll call a certain name. You know, I got one named Cotton, which is one of my older dogs. You know, I call Cotton, and Cotton will come to me. The rest of them won't pay no mind. So when I'm training them, I teach them all to come to their name, not if I said here, and then all, all the whole bunch would come running over, you know. So if I want an individual dog, I'll tell them, then you got to teach them to jump in the truck and then ride in the truck without getting car sick. I mean, there's a lot to it before you ever take the dog to the woods to, to hunt, you know. And then each of the GPS collars I use have a tone on there. So the beep, 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 beep when I push the button. So no matter how far away they are, if they can't hear me and they're 10 miles down a canyon, I don't care what they're doing. If I push that button, that means come back to the truck. They hear that beep, they'll come straight line right back the way they came all the way back to the truck. So that that's the that GPS collar with that training collar built into it. That's the best thing ever made for hunting with dogs because Except if your dogs are going to a highway or getting by somebody's property, you just get them back, you know. It, but it takes a lot of work when they're pups around the yard, teaching them to come to you. You know, you give them a treat, you know, push that tone button, they come to you, give them a treat. Then you, you know, wait a few minutes, do it again. You just do that every day for 10, 15 minutes a day. And pretty soon when they, you know, hear that beep, they know they're coming to you, to the truck, get a treat, praised up, and then move them to the woods you know not necessarily hunting them you take the pups out there to the woods let them run around to the sticks and stuff and then there it's a whole new world for them then there's all the new smells and everything and then you start doing that again teaching them to come to you when you call them come when you call them and then as they get older and start hunting and they hear that beat they know it's time to go back to where they turn loose and it's amazing how they know the track they went because you can look on the gps They'll go out there, you know, 10 miles down a canyon and you tone them back and they'll come right back on the same track they took in there, right back to where you turn them loose. <laughs> so it's crazy how they can, I guess, for their memory and nose, you know, they can smell where they've been. And, you know, they'll come just pretty much to the T right on their same path. That's wild. I, I did not even know about the the name thing i was going to ask you about the collar so you led right into that perfectly would you say that the the dogs train like help train the dogs when you get out there and actually start doing hunts do they do they pick up pretty quickly on what the the older dogs are doing and everything yeah oh, definitely so a good method i use is i'll take if i got a puppy i'll make that puppy live with one of my older dogs and i normally don't pick the fastest dog i got i pick kind of a medium paced dog and i'll make it live with that dog so that way that's his buddy and then when I take him hunting, it'll follow that dog everywhere it goes. And then it'll learn, you know, follow that dog. And then that dog comes back and it comes back with it. Here's the tone, comes back. Or it'll learn, you know, to get on the track. So, you you know, we call them pup trainers. So if you get a dog that's just kind of a good, solid, all-around dog, um, you put that pup with that dog and, and then pretty much follow that dog. And they learn a lot from the other dog. But if you do it with your fastest dog, you know, the pup's, you know, young and can't keep up and then the dog will run off and leave it and then it won't know where it went so that's why it's not good to you know the, the fastest hardcore speed demon dogs are not not the good ones for training pups and then a lot of times if i got a pup that can't keep up if it's too slow and it's you know getting behind to me it's not ready to hunt so i'll keep it and i'll maybe i'll walk it into some trees or let it walk with me but i don't want it to learn to chase the other dogs i want it to learn to chase the track so I'll, you know, hold that dog back, you know, if it's not ready yet. And then I'll, you know, give it another couple months and put it in there. But as soon as it can keep up with the pack, then I'll just go to hunting it with the rest of the dogs, you know, continuously. But yeah, they're, uh, they, the, the older dogs definitely help. You know, if a guy, I've done it before, I've trained him without the older dogs and it's a lot more work. You just got to keep going and taking them out there in the woods and putting them on stuff. But then you don't know if it's a skunk or a coyote or, you know, what they're running, you know, at that point. So, it, you know, it's definitely really tough when they're young, when you don't have an old dog to go by. Because normally the old dogs are broke and they won't run nothing but, you know, good game. And so you put them with them consistently, get them on a bunch of good game, and then they kind of get in their brain what they're looking for. Like, okay, this is what I'm looking for is this fox. 
and then they pretty much break themselves and won't run nothing else but what you're wanting them on um a lot of times like a strike dog like i talked about that's born into them I, also it's not something you can't really train a dog to be a strike dog either they're going to do it or they're not so if you got a dog that's young and wanting to strike everything like skunks and all this stuff i normally leave them in the truck and tell the old dog strike the track and then i'll put them out with the older dogs and then like i say get them on a bunch of them and then they pretty much know okay i'm not supposed to run this skunk i'm supposed to run this but if you go to start, you know, correcting them off of a skunk or off anything at this age, at that age, they don't know the difference from a skunk or a fox or anything. They just know it's a scent. So you can ruin a lot of dogs and discourage them from not wanting to chase anything because they're like, every time I try to chase this, I, they tell me no. And then, you know, so what am I supposed to be doing out here? So I think a lot of guys making mistakes like that is by you know when they got a young dog that wants to strike everything oh it's just a pup we'll, we'll let him go it's just a pup he'll learn later well every time it's running that it's getting better and better and better at chasing that skunk or chasing that deer or chasing that coyote or whatever it is so it's uh you know to me that's the method i use is i'll just put them with the old dogs and try to just keep them on fox when they're young you know and i never take my, young, my real young dogs on bears or lions or anything like that when i go out of state because it's like putting a dog in a ring with mike tyson you know <laughs> or putting a you know a youth boxer in the ring you know they're they need to learn to, the fundamentals and how to track a fox down first you know once they figure all that out and what's going on then you can kind of introduce them some bears or lions or something different but you put them right on on bears or lions i've seen a lot of dogs first time they see that bear they're like heck with this and they'll they don't want to run another one again man that's great that's that's like uh that's a lot of information and and yeah i, I would just say like good stuff for for people that want to get into this to maybe learn about about how to how to train their dogs a little bit and yeah. it, all, it all makes sense right it makes sense from like the, the incentive thing versus because that's what we tell you with every dog you just feed them every time they're doing something good and if you can reinforce that with the other dogs and you know with even the initial stuff then that's that's fantastic yeah yeah dogs are pretty food uh driven so you know every time i feed my dogs i'm doing some kind of training with them whether it's just petting them put my hand in their bowl make sure they're not going to be aggressive or you know making them come to me or you know can't just go in there and just set the food bowl down and let them eat you know you got to make them do something to earn that reward um you know that that's a big key too even if it's just something simple something little make them you know at least come to you don't go to them you know call them to you make them come pet them up good and praise them then give them their food you know that that way that you know when you call their name they know you know the more you do that the, the better it is I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a shameless plug in before I go to the next thing. If if anything that Mike just said, you know, strung hit a hit a chord with you, you know, we're trying to hit 100 subscribers on the channel. So if you guys can smash that subscribe button, it it help us out and help us get more guests on to to entertain you guys and inspire you guys to do some stuff. Um, yeah. So the the I think the last thing I want to get into before we jump into stories, I think you had a good one you wanted to share was you've brought up this, the truck a lot. You have, you've been talking about, you know, how you're training them and hinting at like the different environments that you're hunting in. So the thing that I'm kind of curious about is how many dogs are you bringing out when you're doing a training run versus hunting? And what are some of the different environments, maybe weather, maybe, you know, mountain ranges or whatnot that you're hunting in and then are these like overnight trips or are you out there camping in the woods how do you you know how do you camp with this many dogs and um you know because because you if you're not if you're not in a hotel or anything like how do you make sure you have all their equipment and they're cozy overnight for the multiple days that you're out there so i'm just kind of curious about you know the, the broad span of how these different environments and sleeping arrangements change depending on what you're doing yeah so yeah i've been in all kinds of different environments um you know snow rain um all all the elements um you know been in some mountains that are just thick brush where you're crawling on your hands and knees to get in there uh you know all that stuff but as far as their, the arrangements for the dogs so i have a, a camper dog box so basically underneath the beds of the camper is a dog boxes so the dogs go underneath there and uh, there's shavings in there for them and there's air hole vent holes on the side 
and then you, there's a door in the center that I open, and then I can go in there, and there's a bed on each side of the dog box, and it's got lights and heater and everything inside there. Um, then it's got, you know, a divider in there inside the dog box, so it's like an L shape. So it goes in and then makes an L shape in the back on both sides, and then that way if you got a dog that's coming in heat or something, you can separate them from the other dogs. Um, but they stay very warm in there. It's completely dry. Don't get any moisture in there at all. And then I also have a fan in there that I can turn on if it starts to get warmer. You know, get some air flowing a little bit better in there for them. Um, and then if it's nice weather out, you know, during the day, I got a uh, dogs are a tree. It actually makes it and it's a, a 10 dog tie out or they make it up to a 10 dog tie out. I have the 10 dog one. But you just basically put two stake, stake on each end and then it's got you know, a couple foot little runners on there that are so far apart where you can just tie your dogs out, feed them, you know, let them be out there. And then at night, I always put them in the truck and let them all sleep in there. But I typically take about eight dogs with me when I go. Um, I got, you know, normally a couple younger dogs, a couple older dogs. And then sometimes I have other people's dogs that I'm training for them that I take along with me. Um, but typically I take around eight. And no matter if I'm training or actually hunting or whatever I'm doing, I normally got them all with me. Just, you know, so I can have them with me and know they're taken care of. And even though if I don't take and turn them all loose or whatever, they're normally all all with me. And is this a, like a tow behind trailer? Sorry, no, this is a camper that goes right on the bed of a pickup. Okay, okay. I'll just send you a picture of it so you know what it, what it looks like. But yeah, US, USA Campers makes them down in Southern California. So it's a custom made camper that they make and they they sell a lot of them. But it's special made just for dogs, just for sleep, have sleeping arrangements and dogs. But in the summertime, when it's warm out, a lot of times I won't even take the truck with the camper. I'll take a different my other truck and just sleep out in a cot underneath the stars. You know, it just depends on the time of year and the weather and, and all that. But most of the hunts I go on during the weekends are, you know, overnight trips. Um, like I just went to Nevada last week um, on a bear hunt, and I, we stayed there five days. So we just camped out in our cots. And stayed me and my buddy from Oregon came down and met me and yeah we had a good trip it was a lot of fun we did not harvest a bear we couldn't find one that was big enough but we ended up treeing seven bears um but the biggest one was about 250 so we just catch and release just took some pictures of them and let them go that, that's cool I, I know you've you've kind of highlighted the the truck a lot it that's that's going to be your home base are you often just like driving on the road with the dogs until they catch a scent on something or do you typically park it and like hike out it, it, it all depends on the area uh, if you're in an area that's got okay. a lot of roads and some good roads and you can drive around with the dogs on top i also got a, a mat a little carpet piece that goes on the hood and you can put a dog or two up there so that they can actually smell a little bit better from the hood than they can on the back so the truck's not messing up dust you know they can smell the pheromones and all that and uh so it just depends on the area, but a lot of times I'll just pick a canyon and walk, you know, if there's a canyon that's got water or something in it, I'll just walk, hunt, you know, down through there and then, you know, come out in the lower road and have somebody pick me up or if I'm by myself, I got to walk back all the way up to the truck. But yeah, it just depends on the area and where I'm at, but there's a lot of, a lot of hiking, a lot of walking involved, um, you know, wherever them dogs go, you, you got to go follow them. And there's no trails. It's all just cross country through creeks and rocks and, you know, crawling hands and knees through the brush sometimes it's so thick you know, just just depends on the area you're at and, and where you're at you know like nevada there's cactuses and all kinds of stuff that dogs got to deal with you know and they learn to stay away from them and not you know get them stuck in their tails and all that stuff but yeah everywhere's got their different uh the different you know train and different challenges you know and the rocks, you know, rocks don't hold very good scent. So the dogs hit a big rock patch and then they got to work their way around it and try to get back where they can smell the track again. Um, you know, it takes a smart dog to figure out that, that animal went over the rock. And so then they got to figure out to go around the rock to get on the other side, you know, because, you know, especially lions, they'll jump up on the rock shelves in Utah and the dog can't get up there. So it's got to go all the way around and try to find that track again, where it, the outbound track where it left out of there. But yeah, there's a lot of different challenges. This terrain. Hey, I was, what was that? I said a lot of different challenges, just the terrain wise alone. Yeah, I, I mean, I've never been out with like 
you know, something you need a scent on. Normally you're just trying to make it so the animal's avoiding your scent. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, normally I try to leave time towards the end of the episode to let, let the guests tell any stories they have. So is there any particularly exciting or crazy stories that come to mind that, that you have that you'd like to tell the listeners? Yeah, I got a story to tell. Um, it kind of pertains to the podcast title anyway, you know, it's extreme hiking. <laughs> so uh, a friend of mine came from back east. He came out here to hunt with, with us for a week with me and another friend of mine that lives here. And we were over, we were down in Southern California, kind of by the Kern River. And uh, is you know, big, giant canyons down there, and a lot of brush. So the dogs treat a fox down in there. Um, they were we got to the top ridge and they were down in there, I don't know, like three miles as a crow flies, you know, that's not counting all the ridges and everything got across to get there. So realistically to where the dogs were, it's probably like six miles. So me and the, the other guy took off hiking down there to the dogs, you know, and it was, you know, it was this time of year. So it was fairly warm out. Um, so we were hiking down there and hiking, and hiking, and finally get to the dogs, get all the dogs, you know, tied up and kind of, took a little break there because we were exhausted from walking in there that far and so decided we're going to head back out and he says I don't think I can make it back up that mountain because it's steep I mean it was straight down steep crawling through rocks and brush and everything else and so I said well we can get a hold of uh, those guys on the radio and tell them to go down to the river and we can just walk down to the river which is another I don't know it was probably 10 miles down the river but it was all downhill at least and so we uh we take off and we walk and walk and walk and then he is uh he's getting slower and slower and slower well his feet were blistering up and he had uh he was getting dehydrated so i had to go to the creek and we got more water in the creek and started going again and he's just getting slower and slower but he's not wanting to tell me anything you know and i'm like you know are you okay yeah i'm fine i'm fine i'm fine but i noticed he's just you know not walking like he was earlier so by this time now it's getting dark and so i i you know asked him hey you want to just lay down here and get a little bit of rest and get up in the morning and try it again and he uh he said yeah we'll do that so i got a hold of my other buddy on the radio that was going to pick us up at the bottom and i told him you know we're going to sleep here i'm gonna shut my radio off so it has battery and i'll be up at 5 30 in the morning and i'll call you on the radio so we get up at 5 30 the next morning or if we slept on the side of a hill anyway there was not even a flat spot it was you know it was kind of warm during the day but it got pretty cold there at night and we're just laying out there with all these dogs sleeping by us you know only thing keeping us warm and uh so we, i don't even think i slept i just kind of laid there all night but got up the next morning we start walking out and he's not doing any better he's just getting slower and slower and slower still and just barely going and so you know this was this went on for another six seven eight hours you know trying to get out of there and it's starting to get towards the evening time again and i finally get to where i can get those guys good on the radio and we're like at this point we're only about two and a half three miles from the river but we're like we had we couldn't cross the river because the current river is a big big dangerous river so we had about three miles of the river and about six miles to go down to where the bridge was where we can cross the river so I get a hold of my buddy on the radio and told him what's going on. And he's like, we're going to have to get him help. We can't let him spend our night in here. And so he goes down the river and luckily there was some, they're doing a rescue down. Somebody got in the river or something. They're doing a rescue down there. So they had the sheriff's had their whole team down there at the river. So he told them what was going on, told them kind of where I was at. And so the sheriffs all walked in there, hiked in there to where he was at, got to him. They got his shoes off and his shoes and feet are just blistered and bleeding. And I mean, they were in bad shape. Looked like hamburger meat almost. And uh, so, but he never told me nothing this whole time. You know, I didn't know that he was that bad shape. You know, I just thought he was wore out, you know, dehydrated and all that. But um, yeah, his feet were just, just shot. So they, once they got there, they had a helicopter that was already there. So they took the helicopter that was across the river, flew over to him landed the helicopter 500 yards from where he was sitting and they had to get him to the helicopter now he has no shoes on and he can't walk and they told him if he didn't walk to the helicopter they have to put him in one of those baskets and lift him up and he's said he's not doing that he's going to ride in the inside the helicopter so once the the sheriffs and the fire department whoever it was were there with them i i took off back to the truck so i took off with the dogs went all the way down the trail 
crossed the river, got in the truck, drove around there. And the time I got there, I seen the helicopter flying off. It took him that long to get him 500 yards. I walked six miles by the time he got 500 yards to the helicopter. <laughs> and wow. got, him, got Yeah, then they flew him over to the other side, landed him, and then they put him in the ambulance, evaluated him, all that. And this was our first few days of the hunt, and he was supposed to be there a week. And then he was shot. He couldn't hunt the rest of the week. He just pretty much laid up in his Airbnb that he got for the rest of the time he was there. And his feet were just, just blistered and bruised and... Yeah, he, he had a bad go. And then when he gets back back home, he told all them guys, we, you thought we had rough mountains here. He goes, you haven't seen nothing yet. You need to go hunt those mountains in California. That's some rough, tough terrain over there. But yeah, wow. it, was, that's, it was quite that's the event. That's brutal. <laughs> oh, man. I, I had another, there's another guest that came on and said they, they got trapped on an island and had to get helicoptered off from a storm. But that's that's like nothing compared to, you know, pushing your body to the limit that that's real lucky you guys ran into into the you know the sheriffs there or the fire department yeah i just got real lucky that they were right there already you know because yeah that's, yeah that's, that's pretty that's... much saved him yeah because he he was not making it out of there on his own no way he was done yeah. well mike th this was fun i'm really i think my favorite part of this whole thing was talking about the different training i mean again i've never done this this is this is like a big grounder for me and i feel like i you know at least have a taste from from the knowledge you shared to you know kind of understand what what all goes into the sport um i don't know i hope you had fun is there is there any send-offs or shout outs you want to give before we call it yeah there's one last thing i like to talk about is uh, the different hound clubs in california so i'm the uh, second vice president for the california houndsman for conservation which is a statewide club. And we, uh, we try to get a lot of youth involved, you know, try to, you know, hunting with hounds is a dying tradition. So we're trying to keep that alive. And we we're trying to fight, you know, in California and all these other states too, we help out just, just to keep our hunting alive, you know, with hounds. Um, so yeah, any, anybody that's interested in hunting with hounds or want to come to a dog trial or a houndsman dinner that we put on, you can look up uh, CA Houndsman uh, on Facebook or Instagram. Um, then there's also the California Sporting Dog Association, which I'm the what they call the master of hounds for them. Um, what what's that is I'm in charge of all the field trials, like disqualifying dogs and you know getting all the judges and all that in line. But we also have a bunch of family friendly events where we have barbecues and potlucks and the dogs. Uh, that's a swim race, so the dogs will swim across the pond chasing a coon hide, and the fastest dog wins. You know, and then we give out a belt buckle for the dog that wins the most points at the end of the year. Um, so yeah, if anybody's interested in doing all that, all that stuff's on Facebook, uh, California Sporting Dogs, there's a North Central California Houndsman, another club, um, then there's a Tule River Houndsman, which is in Southern California, I'm the vice president for them. Um, so yeah, we're really big into getting youth involved or anybody that wants to hunt with hounds that's never been and wants to try it out, you know, we're willing to take them, show them what it's all about, just trying to get the, you know, get more people involved in it and get it to grow instead of declining like it has been um so yeah if anybody's interested we've got all that information and fun events that people can attend that's family friendly i'm really glad that you you pitched that because one of the things that we're trying to do with this channel i mean the whole tagline is like you'll push your limits inspire yourself so it sounds like if you get in contact with you know your club or if you're not in california get in contact with another club you don't even have to have any dogs or anything you can just go and you know, maybe find a mentor, kind of see what it's all about yeah, and get your, your feet wet to, to see if it's something you want to pursue on your own. Yeah. Is that accurate? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And just about every state has hound clubs. So you just look them up, find them, you know. Um, so, yeah, and they're more than willing to help somebody out or get them involved. And they, like I said, they all have the same thing, dog trials and events and fundraisers and all kinds of stuff where people can go learn about hunting with hounds. Well, cool. I uh, I will be sure to tag you on Instagram when I post this. I assume that your your like DMs are open. If anybody wants to get a hold of a hold of yeah, the, yeah these clubs or find out more. Yes, for sure. Okay. Well, awesome, man. I had a great time. Thanks for coming on, Mike. Hope you enjoyed yeah, yourself. Yeah, having me on.
Thank you for listening to the Type 2 Fun Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a follow and feel free to reach out to say hello, give feedback, or share your Type 2 Fun story.